Hey, Dr. H here. This will be our final unit review video for the AP test in 2020. So this will be unit six. This covers gene expression and gene regulation. So we started this unit off with a quick look at some of the early DNA experiments. And the two big questions that these experiments were attempting to answer was one, what is the genetic material? Is it DNA or is it protein? Those were the two major hypotheses at the time. And once that first question was answered, the next question then is what does this genetic material look like? What is its structure? And how does it function? So there were a few early experiments that are important here. Uh, the first one here was in the early 1900s, uh, performed by Griffith, and this led to his discovery of the transformation principle, right? That this genetic material could uh, be used to change the phenotype of an organism. Right? Specifically, he was using bacteria and he saw this uh, harmless non-pathogenic strain being transformed into a pathogenic strain of bacteria. He was not able to actually identify the genetic material, however. Uh, that did not happen uh, for a few years when this set of experiments were performed, and these are the Hershey Chase experiments, or the uh, bacteriophage blender experiments. Briefly, what, what they did was radioactively label either the protein in a bacteriophage or the nucleic acids in a bacteriophage, and then tracked which one actually entered the bacteria during the viral infection. What they found was the radioactively labeled nucleic acids, the DNA, is what got into the cell. So this provided the strongest evidence that DNA is the genetic material. Now that question has been answered. The next question then is what is the structure and function of these nucleic acid molecules? And that question was answered in the early 1950s by Watson and Crick uh, using data that was collected by Rosalind Franklin when she was in the lab of Maurice Wilkins. Using uh, Rosalind Franklin's X-ray diffraction data, they were able to come up with this double helix model of DNA structure, where there are two strands of nucleotide monomers wrapped around each other in this spiral uh, structure. On the outside of the double helix are the repeating sugar phosphate groups, and in the middle, holding the two strands together, are the four bases. Watson and Crick also came up with our base pairing rules uh, that A is always base paired across from T and G always base pairs across from C. So as we start to look at how does this DNA, how does this relatively simple molecule uh, lead to our complex phenotypes in our organisms, the first thing we need to look at is how does DNA copy itself, right? We know that this has to happen during cell division so that both of the daughter cells will have a full set of genes. When Watson and Crick first proposed their model, though they did not know how DNA actually replicated, they were able to notice that if we pull the two DNA strands apart, the instructions to build the corresponding missing strand are contained within that strand, meaning that you can very easily copy the template DNA, the single-stranded template, to remake our double-stranded molecule 
because of the strict base pairing rules. And this is certainly what we see with DNA replication. Um, the model for DNA replication is uh, what we call the semi-conservative model, meaning that each new DNA molecule will have one old strand of nucleic acids and one new strand of nucleic acids. So DNA replication, uh, it, this occurs in all living things, of course, because every living thing has DNA as its genetic material, and it all must be copied before the cells can divide. The start sequence for DNA replication is called the origin of replication. In bacterial cells, with a single circular chromosome, there will be one origin of replication and the replication will open up the two strands, form what we call this replication bubble, and that bubble will expand around the circular DNA until the two ends meet and the DNA has been completely copied. In eukaryotes that have linear DNA molecules, there will be multiple origins of replication on each piece of DNA. So each chromosome will have multiple origins. At the end of each replication bubble, there is this uh, structure called the replication fork. And this is where all of the enzymes that are working together to replicate the DNA molecules are found. And there are five important enzymes that all work together to copy the DNA. First is DNA polymerase. That is the enzyme that actually copies the DNA and makes the new DNA strand. Uh, helicase, that goes right at the end of the replication bubble, right at the replication fork and unzips, unwinds the two DNA strands. It breaks the hydrogen bonds that, that hold the bases together and opens up this, the double helix. Uh, DNA ligase, something that we'll talk about when we get to the lagging strand synthesis. Uh, this will, DNA ligase will put small fragments of DNA together to make one continuous strand. Uh, primase, this is important because DNA polymerase cannot make a new DNA strand all on its own. It can only extend a strand by adding nucleotides to an already existing polymer. So primase starts a small little segment that DNA polymerase can then go on and extend. And our final enzyme, uh, topoisomerase actually works a little bit away from the replication fork and this will relax the positive overwinding of the DNA molecule. As helicase pulls the two strands apart, as the DNA unwinds, that will cause the DNA to sort of tighten up, to overwind away from the fork. Topoisomerase will actually break the DNA strands and relax that overwinding. Before we get into the actual mechanism of DNA replication, it is very important to remember that replication can only proceed in one direction along the DNA strand. Okay, these two DNA strands have this five prime to three prime direction based on the orientation of the sugars and phosphate groups. And the two strands are running in opposite directions. So we say that they are anti-parallel. DNA polymerase can only add nucleotides to the three prime end of the growing chain. DNA polymerase cannot add new nucleotides to the five prime end. So what this means in terms of replication, because the two strands are anti-parallel, going in opposite directions, uh, replication is going to look a little bit different on these two strands. The first strand that we are going to talk about 
is what we call the leading strand. Okay, and on this strand, DNA replication proceeds pretty smoothly all in one step. So as the DNA helix is unwound and primase starts its new nucleotide strand, the DNA polymerase can then come in and extend that strand in the five prime to three prime direction and basically just follow helicase along the, the DNA molecule. As the helix is unwound, DNA polymerase can make the new strand of DNA and remake this double helix structure. And this leading strand synthesis is fairly straightforward. On the other side, however, this is the lagging strand, things get a little bit more complex. DNA polymerase cannot add nucleotides to the five prime end. It can only add nucleotides to the three prime end. So on the other side of the fork, on the other side of the bubble, when the helicase opens up the double helix in our replication bubble, the five prime end of our new strand is facing the replication fork. And so DNA polymerase cannot add nucleotides there. So this strand basically has to be replicated in reverse. DNA polymerase has to move away from the replication fork. So this lagging strand is made in short little segments that we call Okazaki fragments. So we have the same enzymes working here. Uh, primase comes in, builds this short little primer, a short little piece. Uh, DNA polymerase comes in and extends that primer out in the five prime to three prime direction. But notice here that this polymerase on the lagging strand is moving away from the fork. It's moving in the opposite direction than helicase is. So as this, these DNA polymerase molecules extend these little fragments, the Okazaki fragments are then joined together by DNA ligase which will seal up these small fragments and make one continuous DNA strand. Looking at the entire bubble all at once, we see our leading strand here on top that is being replicated all in one piece because DNA polymerase can follow helicase right along that strand and create the new DNA strand in a five prime to three prime direction. On the lagging strand, the bottom strand in this diagram, DNA polymerase has to move in the opposite direction to create the new DNA molecule in the five prime to three prime direction. Make sure you know these five enzymes that are involved in DNA replication and what each of them do in terms of making our copy of all of the genetic information within the cell. The next step in expressing our genetic information is making a copy of this DNA information into an RNA molecule. And this is called transcription. Okay, so we are taking the information in the DNA molecule, the sequence of nucleotides, and copying that information into a series of RNA nucleotides. Okay, the start signal for transcription is called the promoter. Okay, and this promoter is a specific DNA sequence that tells RNA polymerase, the transcription enzyme, that it should bind here and which direction it should move to transcribe the important information. There are a few other proteins that will also bind to the promoter and they are called the transcription factors. Um, they will come in and recognize specific sequences in the promoter and help RNA polymerase to bind to the DNA molecule at this site. Okay. Once the RNA polymerase has bound, 
uh, it will begin to unwind the DNA helix and start creating the RNA copy. Okay? And that as RNA polymerase moves along the DNA, the enzyme will produce the RNA polymer. Okay? And here we see the RNA molecule being made in red here, uh, following very, very similar base pairing rules. The only difference is that RNA does not have thymine. It instead has uracil. So whenever there is an A in the DNA sequence, RNA polymerase is going to add a U to the RNA molecule instead of a T that we would find in DNA. This RNA polymerase is the only enzyme that we need to know for transcription. And it will move along the DNA. Again, notice that the RNA molecule is being produced in the five prime to three prime direction. And it, just like DNA polymerase, RNA polymerase will only work in this one direction as well. So transcription will proceed until it reaches the termination sequence which is a specific sequence in the DNA, which marks the end of the gene. And at that point, RNA polymerase will fall off the DNA and the RNA transcript will be released. If it is a protein coding transcript in eukaryotes, there is a processing step that has to occur before the protein can be produced. Okay, and it's very important to remember this only happens in eukaryotes. Okay, bacteria do not do any of this RNA processing. So there are three uh, changes that happen to the RNA molecule, three processing steps. Uh, the first is the five prime end, the beginning of the message is modified by the addition of the five prime cap. The end of the message is also modified by addition of the three prime poly A tail. The five prime cap is just a single nucleotide that is slightly modified in chemical structure that helps with getting this message out of the nucleus and it will also help with getting the ribosome to bind when it is time to translate. The three prime poly A tail plays a similar role in helping to get the RNA molecule out of the nucleus. Our final processing step is called splicing. And this is the removal of these non-coding sequences that we find in the middle of our RNA transcript. And these non-coding sequences are called introns. Okay, they do not code for proteins, only the exons, the dark red regions in the diagram here, actually code for the amino acids. So these introns or these intervening sequences have to be removed and the exons or expressed sequences have to be spliced back together. Okay, and this splicing is performed by this large uh, protein and nucleic acid complex called a spliceosome. Okay, so this spliceosome will recognize sequences at the beginning and the end of the intron, and they will cut the RNA transcript at those points and then seal the RNA molecule back together to make one single piece of RNA that can now go and be translated. Okay, so these three processing steps, the addition of the five prime cap, the addition of the three prime tail, and the splicing out of the introns are very important in order to have the correct message be expressed. Okay, and these only happen in eukaryotes. Okay, so our final step in expressing the genetic material is protein translation. So this 
is taking the information in the RNA molecule and translating it into a protein sequence. The RNA message is read in this triplicate code. Uh, each set of three nucleotides or each codon specifies one particular amino acid. The only codon here that you should really know is the start codon or AUG. Okay, this is the beginning of every protein. This AUG tells the ribosome where to begin making the protein molecule. One other very important aspect of this genetic code is that it is nearly universal. Okay, every living thing uses just about the same genetic code. So it is possible to take a gene from one organism and express it in a different organism and have the correct amino acid sequence, the correct protein, be produced. Okay. The organelle here that creates proteins is the ribosome. Okay. Structurally, the ribosome is made of two subunits, uh, the large subunit sitting on top and the small subunit sitting on the bottom. Within the large subunit, uh, there are three binding sites uh, in order from left to right. They are the E or exit site, uh, the P or peptide site, and A or amino acid site. Okay, and we will talk about what role each of those sites play as we go through the process of translation. To begin translation, uh, the small subunit will bind to the five prime end of a mRNA molecule. Remember, the five prime cap will be there, so that will help the ribosome recognize that this is a RNA molecule that should be translated. The first tRNA or transfer RNA will come in and it will recognize this first codon. Remember, the first codon in every protein is going to be AUG. So on one end of the tRNA will be the corresponding anticodon that will base pair. And this first tRNA molecule will be carrying the first amino acid or methionine into the ribosome with it. The large ribosomal subunit will then bind on top and it will position this first tRNA right in the middle of the ribosome in the P site. The A site will be positioned over the next codon in line, right? the next set of three nucleotides. So translation will then occur in a series of steps the codon that is under the A site in the ribosome will accept the next tRNA in line. Uh, the anticodon on the tRNA will base pair with the codon on the mRNA. And if that base pairing is correct, then the amino acid will be added to the chain. Okay, the chain will actually break off of the tRNA that's in the P site and will be added to the amino acid that is in the A site. So now the P site tRNA is empty. The A site tRNA has the amino acid chain that is one amino acid longer. And then the whole ribosome structure moves down one codon. So the empty tRNA molecule leaves the ribosome out the E site, out the exit site. The amino acid chain that is now one amino acid longer is now in the P site or the peptide site. And the A site is over the next codon ready for the next tRNA to come in and deliver the next amino acid. So this cycle of steps will continue moving along the mRNA, reading the message codon by codon, 
building the amino acid chain, building the protein based on those instructions. This process will continue until one of the three stop codons ends up in the A site. There are no tRNA molecules that have an anticodon that will base pair to this stop codon. Instead, a protein called a release factor will come in to the A site and that will signal that the ribosome is finished and everything will break apart. The two ribosomal subunits will come apart and the protein chain will be released to go and fulfill its function. Okay, so that is the first half of the unit. That is our gene expression, right? Going from DNA to RNA and then RNA to protein. The other very important topic that we that was contained in this unit was how is this gene expression regulated? And first we talked about regulation in bacteria with the operon model. Okay, remember an operon is a series of genes that encode proteins that are all involved in one metabolic pathway and they are all regulated together. The best way to remember this operon model and all of the pieces is remembering the acronym PROG, P-R-O-G, where P is for promoter, R is the repressor protein, O is the operator, and G is for the genes. Every operon has these same functional pieces, just the way that they interact with each other and under what conditions will change a little bit. There are two types of regulation with these operons. Uh, there are inducible operons and there are repressible operons. The first type of operon that I will go over here is the repressible operon. Okay, and here we have the trip operon. Okay, this operon makes the enzymes required for the bacteria to produce the amino acid tryptophan. So when tryptophan is absent, then the bacteria needs to express these genes in order to produce enough tryptophan to survive. So the repressor protein uh, is not bound to the DNA. So when RNA polymerase binds to the promoter, the operator region is empty, so it will move, RNA polymerase will move right through and transcribe all of these genes and the proteins will be produced and the bacteria will begin to synthesize more tryptophan. Okay. Once enough tryptophan has been made in the cell, then the repressor protein will be activated. So tryptophan will bind to the repressor protein and this repressor protein will then bind to the operator region of the DNA. This repressor protein will block RNA polymerase from transcribing. It actually physically stops the enzyme from moving off of the promoter. This is a repressible operon because the addition of our small molecule, in this case tryptophan, turns expression of the operon off. So it is repressed by tryptophan. The other regulatory model for operons, the inducible model, uh, this is the LAC operon. And this is an example of an inducible operon. The enzymes here, the proteins produced by this operon, are involved in digesting lactose. So when lactose is present, it will bind to the repressor protein. The repressor protein will come off of the DNA and RNA polymerase will bind to the promoter and transcribe through the operator 
and create the mRNA that codes for these three enzymes, the proteins will be produced and lactose will be digested. When the level of lactose drops down, then the repressor protein moves into its active form and binds to the operator and blocks RNA polymerase from transcribing. Both of these operons work the same way. Okay, these pieces of the operon all function the same in both types of regulation. The promoter is the site where RNA polymerase will bind and begin transcription. The repressor protein, when it is active, will bind to the operator sequence on the DNA. And if that repressor is bound, then transcription will be blocked. The genes are whatever is needed for this particular metabolic pathway. Okay, so that is regulation in bacteria, a relatively simple operon model. In eukaryotes, it's going to be a little bit more complex. Since eukaryotes have a few more steps along the way, each one of these steps is a potential spot for regulation. So every one of these steps, starting with the way the DNA is packaged in the nucleus, all the way up to how long does the protein hang around in the cell in an active state, all of these are potential spots for the cell to regulate how much active protein is present at a certain time. The most important level of regulation in eukaryotes is at the transcriptional level, right? getting transcription started. There is a large number of proteins that will bind to the DNA at different regions that will help turn on gene expression. Uh, there are some that will actually uh, turn off gene expression under certain conditions. So there are these mediator proteins, there are transcription factors, and some of the mo more important ones that we'll actually talk about are these activators that bind to the enhancer regions that can be fairly far away from the actual gene itself. But the DNA molecule can bend around and these activator molecules can actually contact the RNA polymerase even though they bind quite a distance away from the promoter. And these activator proteins are important not only in turning on or off gene expression under certain conditions, they are very important in what we call differential gene expression, meaning that every cell does not produce every single protein from its genome only those genes that are required for that particular cell type. And this is done uh, mainly through these activators and binding to certain enhancer regions, right? Certain cells will only have a subset of the activators present and genes that have binding sites for those activators will be turned on in that cell type other genes will not be turned on. The final topic that I wanted to touch on here very quickly in the video uh, were a few of the biotechnology techniques that we went over in class that I think may show up on the test. Uh, the first is uh, restriction enzymes. Remember, these are proteins that are found in bacteria that will bind to a specific sequence on a DNA molecule and will cut that DNA molecule at that site. This ability to very precisely and reproducibly uh, digest or cut a DNA molecule allows researchers to manipulate the DNA molecules and create these recombinant DNAs, meaning that we can mix DNA 
from multiple organisms from multiple sources and put them together and clone a gene, uh, meaning putting it into a uh, bacteria and having the bacteria copy that gene to get many, many copies of it. Another biotechnology technique that we talked about in class was electrophoresis. This is the separation of DNA molecules based on their size. A DNA has a negative charge because of all the phosphate groups along the backbone. So when the DNA molecules are placed in an electrical, uh, in an electrical current, they will move to the positive end. So by putting these molecules in this gel matrix, uh, the small molecules will move very fast and the larger molecules will move more slowly. So we separate the molecules based on size. The smaller fragments will have moved further away from the starting point and the larger molecules will be closer. So we can get this restriction pattern based on the specific DNA sequence uh, that we get from digesting our DNA sample with one of our restriction enzymes. And our final biotechnology technique is PCR, or the polymerase chain reaction. And this is a method for greatly amplifying the amount of DNA we have in a sample without having to actually clone our piece of DNA into a bacterial cell. Basically, PCR is just a repeating cycle of three temperatures. Uh, first is a very high temperature to denature the DNA strands, meaning that the two strands of DNA will come apart, the hydrogen bonds will break, so we will have single-stranded DNA molecules. The second step is a lower temperature, and this is the annealing step. In this step, uh, short little uh, nucleic acid molecules called primers, which we have added to the reaction mix, will base pair to our target sequence on either side. And then the final step is our extension step. And this is a little bit warmer, and that temperature will activate the DNA polymerase that is in our reaction mix. And DNA polymerase will extend out from these two primers that we added and make the target sequence. So this cycle of three temperatures, denaturing, annealing, and extending, are repeated over and over and over again and that greatly amplifies the amount of our target DNA sequence that we have. A typical PCR run will be about 30 cycles, and that will give us over a billion-fold amplification of our target DNA sequence. So that is the end of our Unit 6 review. And it's also the end of our unit by unit review for the 2020 AP test. Uh, I know you guys are gonna do great. So best of luck. And hopefully I'll be able to see all of my students again next year.